All right, well, thank you. Um, I'll be talking about the relationship between social capital and social presence, and the title is not really in a way to war any um, kind of um, inspirational, it's capitalizing on social presence. Um, I would like to talk about actually um, why I am doing this research, just to give a little bit of background, and it will explain why I'm doing this and why I want to continue with that. So I was, um, of course, um, a student, and then I was taking a course on communication, computer-mediated communication media and learning theory, and that was an online course. And um, one of those readings was just focusing on the learning theories and the um, um, individuals in that environment. And the, the, the term came up in that reading, social capital, social presence. And I was very much interested in that. And then as a final paper, I want to write something on social presence. But then um, it became much more complicated than I thought because I was really confused with what it is actually, to be honest, because there's so much definitions of um, social presence. And everybody, almost every other research that's been published has a different definition of that. And I was just quite intrigued by that, why people had to define it. Uh, is it because that it's hard to understand or is it because that it was better definition for the purpose of the research they want to do? And I just really did a very thorough um, research, I guess, much more than was expected from a little course. And I guess I was uh, a little bit keener, maybe. <laughs> But then uh, I, I ended up with this idea that um, people just come up with the definition because the definition itself isn't enough to understand what um, humans are in this online learning environment. And the social presence, um, in a nutshell, is just about human beings in online environments. And it defines who we are and what we do or how we get to understand others in the environment. And because it's a very, actually, a complex social phenomenon that it's dealing with, um, the term itself was becoming very um, limited in, in, its, in, in its explanation. Um, so here I go, based on that um, very genuine interest on social presence, I did every other work in my um, um, scholar history on social presence, and I never probably let it go because it's a very um, intriguing topic still. Um, so to, to Coming back to the, uh, the presentation today, moving on uh, from social presence or the history of this research, uh, I'm looking at how social presence can actually um, be used to understand the, the complex social phenomena like who we are and what we do in online, le online learning environments. So I start from the theories of learning. Um, so we all agree that learning is a social and an individual uh, process and then we, um, we get to understand each other and we get to understand who we are in relation to people around us so that we can actually make sense of our interactions with people. And that's the central tenet for social cultural learning theories. So in put in other words, put in different way, um, learning is about the process of uh, mediation between us and the people around us. And this mediation is really important pr uh, aspect and there's many different theories to explain that mediation, one of which is uh, actor network theory or some other theories can be named, but when it comes to online learning theories, that mediation part is um, extremely understudied. So we don't really know about how those um, interactions are actually mediated and what can be said about their impact on the learning. So this is why I thought social capital can help us to understand that. Um, so this mediation between self and others is called actually subjectivity and uh, in online learning environments, social presence is used to um, explain this term subjectivity. So this is why I'm going through this um, social presence. So the current definition of social presence is that, um, this is something that I concluded from the literature. It's the definition of many people. It's the degree to which individuals represent themselves and uh, perceive others in digitally mediated environments. So this um, definition, of course, started way early, back in the 50s and 60s, and through the time, online educational scholars appropriated the term to um, explain what they really mean by the social presence, and now I'm going to be talking about that. Um, the term itself, social presence, is coined back in 1956 or 57 um, from communication media scholars, so they were technically doing a research on the capacity of medium to convey social cues. So the research was actually very um, basic. Somebody was sitting in a room in an isolated manner, and then there was somebody else in the other room. 
and then they were making these people, these two people connect to each other through different media, which is um, starting from the paper and a pencil going through um, the, the television technology back then. And then they were um, asking people to what extent they feel the other person real. And then based on the capacity of this medium, um, they were saying some medium is very hot, meaning that it's very um, personal, and some medium is very cold, meaning that it's very unpersonal or impersonal. Um, so they coined this term social presence to define the extent to which someone can make sense of the other. So back then it was all about the, uh, how somebody can make sense of the other person. It wasn't, it wasn't about like how we could make, the, uh, uh, make sense of ourselves. Um, so the first era focusing on the social presence research was looking at the, uh, the capacity of the media to convey the nonverbal information. And uh, for the educational research, for the educational technology, th this was also the time that uh, online education was not around because there was no such um, thing as the internet that we could use as uh, regular human beings. Perhaps it was just uh, back then the, uh, still the military project. And um, so for the educational research, it refers to the, uh, the correspondence type of, it, type of education where we send the materials to people and then every five or six months or something like that, they were going to some central places and just getting the uh, exams and things like that. So this is, this is what the social presence was about. It's just how much you can say, make sense of the, um, the teacher or the course or something like that. Um, as we moved on with the technology, the idea of social presence has evolved and the second era comes to the time when uh, the internet was becoming a prominent tool for the online and this, for the distance education. And this is the time also that researchers were influenced by the cognitive learning theories. Um, so it was, there was a lot of attention on how people um, actually understand themselves and perceive each other. So uh, from looking at others, the era now in the second era, I'm talking about the second one, is focusing more on the uh, um, people itself, but less on the media. So people, when, um, this, this is roughly translated to um, late 80s and early 90s. Uh, in this time, uh, when people were doing social presence related research, they were actually looking at how people actually get to um, present themselves in the online learning environments. And um, it was the, time that we could find actually very early versions of Facebook-like um, learning environments where people just, you know, um, use whatever the technology available to explain themselves and who they are. So moving on from this um, very static internet technologies to um, coming to more contemporary technologies that we know today, which is the third era that I um, argue is that we're looking at the social presence as a facilitating element. So now we have the current definition of social presence. It is how we present ourselves and how we get to understand others around us. So if you look at our online courses, for example, um, students not only be able to talk about um, who they are and talk about what they do in their um, profession, or, uh, they also get to know who the other people are in this environment. And based on this understanding, they can always um, make sense of the context so that they can um, always make much better interactions with everyone else because all of a sudden you know who you're talking to and that definitely changes the tone of the, con uh, tone of the conversation. So the social presence, again, I'm gonna go back to this uh, definition, is the degree to which individuals represent themselves and perceive others in digitally mediated environments. However, um, even though we're in this third era that I believe uh, we're looking at to facilitate an element, the definitions of social presence are still derived, derived from the, uh, the second era where the cognitive and the psychological aspects were much more prominent. So even though we think social presence can explain um, social aspects of the on, uh, life in online learning environments, I believe it just doesn't quite do so. I think social presence is actually very much um, limited in its explanation of um, how interactions happen in online learning environments because um, first of all, like I said, the definition itself is focusing on much more on the psychological aspects and it has very little to do with how um, we, we might have different relations. So the current definition is thinking that my relationship with the person in here would be the same with the person in here, but um, we are different individuals and this person is different than this person. So I might have much more um, connections with this person over there but I might want to maybe work with this person. So the, the nature and the quality of this um, social ties are actually different. 
and social presence is absolutely nothing to do with this kind of um, nuanced differences in the social life in online learning environments. So I needed something else to show this, uh, this aspect that's lacking in the uh, definition of social presence. So I thought social capital would be a good um, thing to talk about because social capital is um, looking at how the connections might have different um, values in itself. So the central tenet of social presence is that uh, relationships within networks people have different values and when these different relationships when these relationships are aggregated, um, social capital is exercised and um, all these relationships can actually benefit us in different ways. So um, it, it's, it, it was the piece that would actually um, complement on the social aspects of the social presence. And in this research, I was just looking at how or to what extent social presence is actually related to the social capital or how much or to what extent social presence can actually um, help us to understand um, social capital or vice versa actually to be honest social capital can help us to understand um, the social aspects of the life or the social aspects of the social presence um social capital am i going all right social capital um has much longer history than the uh the social presence it's been around for a long time and it's been studied extensively much more so than social presence. Um, social capital um, is coined, um, um, social capital as coined by Pierre Bourdieu and um, many other people are also associated with the, 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 uh, the definition. For example, James Coleman and um, Robert Put Putnam are also very prominent with the definitions of social presence. Those are the three um, for people um, that almost any social presence, any social capital research relates um, to these people. And the social capital is that connections, is looking at the, uh, the connections within and between social networks. The definition of social capital is that it's the aggregate of the actual and potential resources um, which are linked to possession of a durable network of a more or less institutionalized relationships of mutual acquaintance and recognition. So this is actually the definition coming from um, Pierre Bourdieu himself. And the educational value of social capital is that um, it can tell us about the opportunities for members to establish a common ground where the, uh, the meaning making can happen. So this is actually where we can trace the educational value of social capital to social cultural learning theories. There's a value in all these um, relationships and it's an important aspect of learning because we have to know who we are talking to. I don't know why I'm just uh, having a problem with that. Um, of course, the social capital theory has been developed ever since it's been um, coined and it's been around. So there are two, um, there are many different levels of social capital, but two of them are uh, most important and much more cited or circulated around. One of which is bridging social capital, and it refers to the um, relationships from people and from pe people from other communities and other cultures and socioeconomic backgrounds. It provides a basis for collective action by allowing individuals to share their um, histories and experiences and uh, establish their common grounds and values. So in a sense, bridging social capital is referring to the, uh, the diverse connections. It's referring to the um, quote unquote, the weak connections, weak but diverse connections. It's about like the Facebook friends. You might have 10,000 friends that you might even have no idea who they are, but in a sense that you are a friend, it's like a weak ties that you might know. Um, for the educational value of is that um, um, th th there is a literature on online learning theories arguing that these uh, relations might be valuable so that people actually have diverse backgrounds to tackle with the same phenomenon. So when you bring um, people from health, care or health sciences with the computer sciences and the educational people, there would be um, a different um, aspects to tackle with the same problem. So it would actually enrich the learning experience. So even though social, uh, the bridge in social capital has been, hasn't um, voiced um, clearly, 
online education research can actually uh, explain that this region social capital is a valuable thing. The other type of social capital is that bonding, bonding social capital. It, re it refers to the uh, strong ties and strong attachments, but um, bonding social capital happens with, um, with very little people. So this is the opposite of the Facebook friends. So you might actually have real friends that you really can go out and do something that you really know them. So in a sense, maybe you don't have um, 10,000 bonding, you know, social capital type of people, but you might have very few, but then you also need them. Um, again, uh, for the online education research, for the online learning research, this bonding social capital hasn't been used um, explicitly, but the literature argues that this kind of types are this kind this type of relationships are also very important for online learning because when it comes to working with people, when it comes to working with um, group work, you really want to know who you are working with and you really have to work with the people who are similar interests to you so that um, the work that you would do is going to be much more meaningful and relevant to your background. So in a sense that online education, online research, online literature is supporting both type of interactions even though they never used uh, the concepts of bonding social capital or the bridging social capital. The literature argues that both type of uh, relationships are valuable and we need both type of relationships. So for this kind of research, I started from um, a quantitative basis. Um, I want to um, spend a little bit time on this methodology because um, I've been told that um, it might be very beneficial for the people in uh, educational research department, the students uh, might benefit from a quantitative aspects of it. And um, so why I did this research quantitatively is that I actually had no idea where to start from. And I thought this quantitative analysis would give me um, a picture to look at and it would give me um, a basis, a background to refer to when I expand this research. It's going to not give me a lot of details on the questions that I could have asked, but it's actually going to give me a, a place that I can start asking the questions. So there's this concept called social presence, extensively studied, but it doesn't necessarily do the job that I'm um, interested in, which is the social relations. And there's this concept called social capital, which is um, used in um, research a lot, but when it comes to online learning, that, that concept hasn't been actually explored enough. So I'm bringing these concepts together and I don't really know where to start from. So what I did was that I just look at the, um, to what extent this can be related and to what extent these two concepts can explain each other or complement each other. So I decided to do um, um, a regression analysis for that, which will follow up in the um, coming up slides. So I collected data from 11 fully online graduate level courses. These courses were I'm not sure to say whether similar or different from the courses that we have in here. I think similar in a way that um, they're online courses and then there's readings and then the people engage with each other on online forums and then um, they write final paper at the end. But then um, these courses are not done in a, um, in a cohort manner. So anybody can take courses and this was a very, very big institution. And even though um, they don't have cohort system or they have full-time students. They could be all over the world. So not so in a, in a sense that it's similar to our students. Um, they don't necessarily know each other, but they could be full-time students just, you know, taking the same elevator, but they have no idea, you know, they're taking the same course. Um, so what I did was that um, I used a Likert type online survey with five point questions with the two main sections. The first section is looking at the perceived level of social presence. Um, this is coming from an online learning literature and, and like I told you already, um, social presence has been studied extensively so um, measurements are available so I pick one of the most cited ones. However, when it comes to social capital, it, um, it hasn't been studied in online learning so that was a problem. Um, there are studies looking at the online social capital but they are looking at from the communication and interaction um, aspects and they have very little to do with the educational aspects. So this questionnaire had to be appropriated for the um, educational research. Um, so in total, I had 217 students responded to the survey, um, but we have to do some um, analysis on the 
the data that we have, the first thing that we did was to take the uh, inactive students off the data. And because in these courses, students can register to a course and then they can drop off the course within four weeks without any penalty. So what happens is that students usually register for a course, they just take a few weeks and see if they like the course and if they want to continue or not. So um, there was a couple of students who apparently were not really engaging with the, um, the course and we therefore concluded that they dropped the course and their data should not be included. So we cleared some data, we took those people out. And then of course with the problem with this kind of Likert surveys is that once you start doing the survey, it doesn't mean that one is going to finish the survey. So there was also um, incomplete data sets that we also um, took this one out. So once we cleared the data, we came down to 198 students doing the study, which for a quantitative study, good enough numbers. So I, I'm uh, now looking at the, uh, the social capital questionnaire. Um, I hope it's clear enough. Um, I have to do a little bit of explanation in this one. So uh, the first part of the social capital questionnaire is looking at the, uh, the bridge in social capital. And the bottom part is looking at the bond in social capital. And these are the questions. So now we're looking at actually the, the factor analysis of the questions, which would tell us whether the questions that we have is actually doing the job that they're supposed to do. So this is, in a, this is actually done right, the uh, reliability and the valid, validity analysis of the questionnaire. And we had, I, we had to do this because this questionnaire hasn't been used in the, in the online learning literature before. So we really had to make sure that the questionnaire is actually doing the job it's doing. Um, so the factor loadings mean, means that um, whether this question is actually can be grouped with all the other questions in this little, um, w within its um, group. So, so it's telling us whether this question can actually be concluded in the bridge in social capital. So we have dots in this one, question number nine in bridging and question number nine in bonding. Um, it, the, the program told us that these two items are actually not significantly related to these categories. So the, the, the factor analysis resulted that uh, these could be actually either so it's not really as significantly related to this or significantly related to that. So we really had to delete that question because um, this is, I guess, how factor anal analysis is done. And then we have also two stars in here on question number three on the bonding social capital, which also tells us that if we delete this question, this alpha score is going to be here 573 and uh, for the reliability test alpha score above six would be much more um, appreciated for the quantitative research. So therefore we unfortunately have to give up that question too so that that would be also a, not only a valid but also a reliable scale for us. So after this little uh, mechanics on the um, questionnaire, we had nine questions in here and eight questions in here to understand how bridging and bonding social capital might work in online courses. Right, like I said, haven't verified the structure of the social capital scale, uh, of the social capital scale. Now we then look at the, uh, the relationship between social capital and the social present. And for that, we use the linear regression analysis. Um, so technica technically speaking, there were also, when we do the regression analysis, you also have to look at the data and um, go through some outliers or signifiers that, that might actually bias the results. And once we did this analysis, we decided that 15 cases have to be taken off from the data because they were um, biasing the results. I guess that's the thing that I can say. Um, once we took this 15 cases, the data came down to 183. And our scores and um, standard deviation indicates that we can actually now look at the full analysis or the full results so that our data is now clear enough or valid enough or statistically speaking again, uh, valid enough to um, make the analysis. Um, so the results reveal that social capital and social presence are correlated, meaning that there's actually a meaningful and uh, statistically significant relationship between them. They're not actually quite different from each other. 
However, breaking social capital um, is much more related to social presence, while bonding social capital has very little to do with the social presence. And the regression model explains 60% of the total variance. It means that, uh, which is actually amazingly high score for a um, variance. Uh, so it means that our, there's actually quite significant relationship between the two, uh, social presence and social capital. So this is the table actually with all the writings in, uh, in the previous slide. So you could see here, bridge and social capital is actually much more related to significantly related to uh, social presence, while bonding social capital is related, but not significantly. So the results shows us um, different things, or, it could, or the results could be interpreted in three different ways. Um, students might be, pref uh, might be preferring bond, uh, bridging social capital over bonding, or it could be because that our um, measurements were biased, or it could be because that online learning environments are stru structured in a way that we um, actually focus on the bridging social capital more than the bonding social capital, which will be um, uh, I'll be talking about that in actually the, uh, in the following slide, but um, so when it comes to actually the social aspects of social presence, we were only focusing on the diversity of the relationships, and there could be many reasons for that. First, there could be an error in the way that we're looking at what social presence is, because um, as we appropriate the concept, we might actually focus on different aspects of the social presence, because back then in the 50s, it started as the capacity of the medium, and today we're actually looking at uh, the, the mediation between us and the people around us. So from that to here, in that transition, there could be a lot of things that we might actually miss with the, um, the concept itself. Um, so if actually we are looking at the diversity of the relationship as opposed to the density of the relationships, it's actually quite contradictory with the original um, definition. In 1950s, people actually were looking at to what extent it's actually the quality of the relationships that the media can convey to what extent we can really understand the other person as a real person. And today, uh, it's quite a different, so that's a quite a different change. The second result is that because um, online learning practices might inherently privilege in the uh, diverse relationships. So in a way that students go into an online course and then they don't really know who the people are around them and they just create enough ties, enough relationships with the people around them so that they could work within the course. And then once the course is done, they move on with their life. They don't really have to develop any strong ties with them because weak ties are just enough because you just have to know who is with you and who is around you and who, can, who you can work with when you need to. And then once the course is done, you're done too and you move on to the next course. Perhaps this is something different than in our um, um, cohort level teaching, but um, in online teaching, I guess, in a very regular sense, um, it could be the practice that we are actually inherently privileged in diverse relationships. And the third one is that students just don't want to um, develop these kind of strong ties. Maybe they just don't feel comfortable. It's only a theory that because uh, there's a collaboration, there's going to be a good learning. It's only a theory that maybe because that we are close enough, we're going to work together or we're going to just enjoy working together. So maybe students just don't feel like developing these kind of um, strong relationships with the people around them. Maybe, when, maybe once the purpose is just education, it's, these strong ties may not be that important. Maybe we just put too much emphasis on these strong ties. Maybe all they need is just strong enough ties, which in this case, um, it could be just a weak ties. So whatever the results are, or whatever this hypothesis could be, um, it is quite interesting that social presence has moved a lot from what it was in the 50s and has moved a lot from what it really meant. And it really cannot um, explain us what is really happening socially, even though the term itself is social presence. It's still explaining us um, the psychological aspects of the human being. It only tells us who we are maybe or how we present ourselves, but it doesn't really tell us how we get to perceive others in this environment, even though it was the definition widely used in the literature, it really doesn't um, just tell us. 
And the final conclusion is that when we talk about social presence, we also be talking about just um, one aspect of the social lives, which is the, how, the, how people the, uh, perceive themselves as opposed to how these complex social relationships um, evolved or maintained for the purpose of education. And that would be it. Okay, thank you. Yeah. <laughs>
were those always, always in areas of the country where the local authority was controlled by the Italian Communist Party. Always. But of course, he, he wanted to divorce his findings from politics. So, you know, whatever you feel of the Cold War politics of the Italian Communist Party, nonetheless, you could argue that that has a kind of grassroots upwards pushing towards politics kind of thing. So I wonder whether you think that this, this social capital in the online era has a similar kind of hangover to it, which is to say it's more about how can we support people less, let them get on with it more, and hope that basically they don't moan at us or cause us any trouble, or does it have a more emancipatory thing that could be developed? Um, I think that's a very good aspect that you mentioned. I haven't scrutinized critically enough social capital only because that I wanted to focus on its practicality more than history because um, technically social presence is much more um, educational concept than social capital, even though they're equally valuable. Um, the literature focused on one over the other, so this is why I was focusing on one over the other. But that's definitely true that the concept itself is um, very much a um, debatable thing. Um, definitely, the I don't I don't think that I can only speculate on the emancipatory action as opposed to um, oppressive um, um, uh, um, qualities of it, but definitely it could be said that in fact um, it was in one of the limitations in that paper that we didn't actually look at any of the demographics, um, so that it could be a lot of gatekeeping with related to social capital particularly the bonding social capital, there could be close-knit communities who would actually be very much um, exclusive in ways that they work or in a ways that they interact with people. And um, again, same gatekeeping could happen um, with, with many different um, settings. It could be gender-based or racial-based or ethnic-based things, and that could be definitely an um, important thing to look at. Um, but it is also um, emancipatory in a way that it would give everyone else an opportunity to break in that gatekeeping, which is bridging social capital. Because if I know you that you are in a particular member of a thing, I can always just try my chance to be part of that group. So in a way that it could also um, expand opportunities for certain people too. So I think it's both at the same time, depending on how things are functioning within a given community. But that is definitely and the limitations that I actually mentioned and moved on without much discussion like this, and I, I really appreciate that. Great. Can we and then Paul? So going back to the social I'm just curious whether it's possible for us to measure the development of capital within the three Mm -hmm. Like when originally the piece of coin and analyze the capita, it was more accumulated social like social network development, generation after generation, so like the top certain um, economic and class group of class, they have more resources. So that whole con that notion of social capita, I can see that it can be a to setting to measure something, but at the same time, I'm just questioning whether we can actually call that how students perceive the other students to themselves as the term capital. Mm -hmm. I do. So I was really, I mean, I know this kind of motion is getting really popular. You're like, this paper has been cited a lot, but one of my concerns was that like, the use of capital motion is kind of too shallow. Mm -hmm. you are you are absolutely right it's one of the biggest criticisms that could be done or provided for this kind of paper is that actually a there isn't enough time for capital to be developed and b to what extent we can actually measure it uh, so for the b part i'm going to pass it on to the uh, the shortcomings of quantitative research. It's, <laughs> some people argue that it could be measurable and they develop um, scales for that and therefore I used it. And yes, definitely it's a co much of a qualitative concept actually, to be honest. And, um, and measuring social capital for large groups, I believe, is also very much useless because even though we are in the same community, the level of my interactions with people would be much different than somebody else's. So the capital would be different. And for the concept or the phenomenon to be capital, 
there has to be some gains. So where is that gain and how that gain can actually be um, operationalized for the learning is actually very much missing in the concept it itself for the um, online learning. So those are the areas definitely I would be looking at further. I'm not really sure that if I'm going to continue in relation to doing that, doing that in relation to social presence or not, but definitely I agree with that kind of criticism. It's um, very much um, one way of looking at it. And uh, I had to look at it that way to begin with, and therefore I did. That's what I was saying with this um, methodology part. It's, um, and this is not to say like, look, I've done something very innovative, but literally there was absolutely no research done uh, to bring social pre capital into online learning, particularly in relation to social presence, and to see what is it that we have in hand is that um, to look at quantitatively, and then now it's time to tease out all these different little things and build on all these um, limitations and explore a little bit better. Brilliant. Okay, Paul, and then we'll ask um, Jan, who's on remote, <coughs> if she has a question. Um, <coughs> that, thanks, Mara. That, that, that's really interesting, and I, I think for me in that presentation, you, you raise a number of difficult issues. And I guess to, you know, what I should say is what I'm struggling here with are those issues rather than necessarily your presentation with them. Um, but in, in terms of, you know, just thinking about your the definition of social presence, I mean, to explain, explain social capital, they're very individual definitions. You know, so if, you know, so, so you said it's about how you represent, how they, people represent themselves and how they perceive others. Whereas, you know, if you take a sort of, you know, ground, you know, social cultural approach that's informed by Vygotsky, things happen on the social plane before they happen on the individual plane. So it's not about representing yourself, it's about constructing yourself within a particular environment. And, and, and then I think if you think about social presence in those terms, then, it be, then the context and the purpose that you're in that environment will become absolutely central to what you're doing. Whereas if you say, I'm representing a fixed self, then the context and purpose is less important because there's this fixed self. Whereas if you say, well, actually, within any social context, what I'm doing is I'm constructing a particular identity for a particular purpose with particular resources, for me, it, it shifts how social presence gets defined. And, and I think there's a similar thing with social capital sort of going going on there of of you know, for, you know the you know the way Bourdieu approached social capital is it only makes sense in relation to field and habitus. So it, it, it's a, you know it's within a particular field but with particular things at stake. And again those sort of more collective ways of viewing these things I, I think would give you a very you know a very different notion of what might count as both capital and, and yeah and, and the one thing that would definitely give you is that any capital constructed with an online environment is related to what's at stake in that online environment and then how that transfers out is immediately you know a question that <coughs> doesn't have an obvious answer so 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 I guess I wonder how much you felt constrained by those very individual notions of these concepts whether you'd accept that you know um, analysis of them being very individual and whether you have a sense of ways in which you could develop more collective social um, you know ways of thinking about social presence and social capital. Well I do definitely accept with every, almost everything with what you said and the whole point of that kind of research was to actually mock the concept of social presence and just to show that it's actually <coughs> not really working and exactly the things that I believe in um, about the representing oneself is um, exactly what you said. It's, it depends on what's at stake. It, depend, it depends on what's the task that we want to do. So um, what's at stake in here and what I'm doing right now is pretty much related to why I'm sitting in here, why I'm putting this like jacket that I only wear on the purpose of the video and things like that. So it's, it's something to do with the uh, online learning too. So when, when people are over there, it's almost like a, a contest, like a beauty contest. There's um, certain um, things underscored when students just present themselves and it's always related to being a good student and what a good student is of course open to debate but so it's pretty much to do with 
the, the social context. Uh, and definitely, yes, I agree that um, the current definition of social presence is uh, not really considering anything in that term. It's just asking how we do you, like, how do you get to know others? And it's, it's, it's a very simplistic questionnaire. And, um, and, and that was the starting point, even though the term itself is social presence, it's definitely not social at all. And it's only focusing on one aspect of many different presences can uh, an individual possess in an online learning environment. So definitely agreed and definitely and hopefully that um, next steps would include much more better understanding of social presence and build on that. And again, that also relates to the social capital too. It's um, also looking, and if, if you clearly look at the questions, it's asking, do you feel someone that you can ask money from, or if you feel that you can ask someone that um, you can work with? So those are very simple questions. I mean, I can work with anyone if I have to, right? So, but I mean, again, that's um, that's what is the current state, and I had to start from there, and definitely I would use that to find and argue actually, in fact, we need much better phenomenon or much better concept to actually understand what's happening. It's just a little illusion right now. Okay, I was just going to see if Jan had a question or a comment remotely. Can you hear me, Jan? Yes, I can. Um, thank you very much, Mirat. That was really interesting. Um, I have a, a methodological question, and, um, and that's because actually, um, as I think we've discussed before, I was really interested in your take on quantitative analysis, knowing that you come from a, a very critical background, um, and sort of, as, and I'm just wondering whether you looked at different ways of approaching this as a quantitative study, because you seem to have gone down, and, and for perfectly good reasons, a fairly conventional approach. And I'm just wondering whether you looked at alternative forms of doing this sort of analysis quantitatively. Well, I don't, but I don't know why. <laughs> um, well, I mean, um, this, this is debatable, of course, but when it comes to quantitative analysis, there are certain analysis is done for a certain purpose. And just because I'm critical, I couldn't do anything else and say, you know, let's look at this data differently. It's If I was going to make some conclusions, I have to use certain um, forms of analysis one of which was regression analysis, and that comes with certain uh, post hoc and ad hoc tests to understand that if our data is, you know, usable and valid and reliable. Uh, but I guess if I was going to do this research all over again, or if I want to continue any quantitative aspects, I would definitely be looking into more um, sub category analysis. So it's not like one concept of social presence and one concept of social capital or one concept of or subcategory of social press, uh, so bridge and social capital. I would try to tease out more um, little aspects of that and, and try to find much more dynamic relationship between these uh, or many other um, factors that could be in play in here. So um, right now I was very um, limited with the, the methodology itself. But again, I'm going to defend the methodology in a way that um, that was the first step to start. And now it's, I guess, up to uh, me or anyone else who wants to continue if they find the research valuable to figure out different ways to um, really understand that. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks, Jan. When you define social capital or discuss potential definitions of social capital, you used um, Borgia and you talked about durable networks. Mm -hmm. Was there any aspect of your methodology that, that attempted to measure the durability? Mm. And as a sort of sub question, I'm quite in, and it relates to what other people have said, I'm interested in how you see your measurements of measuring social capital as opposed to social interaction? Well, the first question is actually a really nice one, but the uh, actually I didn't do anything to measure the durability of my hoped and assumed, I guess, take, take it for granted that relations were durable actually only because that they stayed in the course, in the online course, and I guess that was the only um, answer I could provide 
because they stayed in the course and I, therefore there must be a durable relationship. But it's a big assumption, definitely. But I think that will relate to whether it's capital or not, whether it can, it can be used, it can be utilised as a resource, um, rather than just a kind of interaction for a period of time. Um, and I think that your bonding and bridging capital can both be durable, mm -hmm. and durability is probably what makes them something that can be capitalised upon. Yes, agreed again, and uh, I, the research doesn't actually consider that, and that's definitely something that I will definitely keep in mind if I want to continue. That's, that's actually a very good aspect, very good to consider. I mean, for wanting just to, um, you know, defend the research, just to, just to sake of it, um, the scales were there, so, and, and statistically speaking, they do their job, but again, it's, definitely open to discussion and argument and definitely agree with you actually to be honest with doing the research that uh, it may not be actually doing it but statistics says that it does and it's up to us to uh, you know just be reasonable and disregard statistics and actually look at it so no I didn't do anything but um, that's definitely uh, something. Uh, well, yeah, well, I noticed the one word that you didn't use, or maybe you did use it, but I just didn't quite uh, register, was networking, because uh, mm -hmm. often when people ask the question, why come to a campus university, why not do it all via books or go to university, the answer that you'll get back to, well, it's all about networking, and what that word often has quite cynical connotations, it's about establishing mutual back-scratching networks mm -hmm. that you can use, that I use the word again, you can use later in life. Um, and I, I just wonder whether, um, is, is that really what students are doing when they come to, uh, I mean, uh, to, to what extent is that kind of networking related to, to bridging, is mm -hmm. my question. I mean, I was thinking particularly of um, you know, our, our new Chancellor, Alan Milburn, who of course is a famous Lancaster graduate, has talked effusively about how wonderful his experiences were at Lancaster and how much um, fun he had, which I presume would be of the bonding nature rather than the bridging nature. But when he was sitting around the cabinet table when he was, I wonder how many of his fellow um, uh, cabinet members had spent their time at university bonding rather than bridging. I reckon that they, they would have done as much bridging at Oxbridge, uh, you know, much more network building than he did at Lancaster. And of course, how does that then relate to, um, to power structures and things like that? Well, I mean, the research itself has nothing to say about that, but um, for my dissertation, I really had to get into people's lives. And then um, based on that experience, I can tell that um, it's actually very random that people continue this kind of bridging or bonding relations. And I definitely can say that I met uh, or talked with people or interviewed with people who were referring to people that they met on the courses and they are now um, doing joint activities or um, using themselves as to find jobs because, you know, when you're a student, you might also be looking for a job doing this course. And um, I also um, interviewed people um, who were teaching in, around the same area somewhere in um, South Korea, I guess. they figure that they're very close to each other, so then they start seeing each other like two Canadians, I guess, in over there. And, uh, but, I mean, again, to what extent these could be actually capitals is, I don't know, when really the research doesn't say anything about it, but um, definitely, I, as a, for, from an experience, I know that um, people tend to continue these relationships if they're really useful, so I guess that indicates that there's a capital to it, so. Kind of a vague answer, but that's yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, I suppose you could turn it into some kind of defence of distance learning and say, well, yeah, actually, you can network via distance learning as well. It's not necessary to be on campus. Yeah, definitely, definitely could be. You could, you could say that. And I think that speaks to the uh, the third era of social presence research. The first one was just a correspondent type of research where institutions send material to people and everybody was alone and now it's more about the mediation, interaction, networking, I guess.
the, this question really about social presence, which is basically a term I don't know much about. Um, and when you were providing an overview of it, I was kind of surprised when you went through the history of it because I imagined it would be something, even it might not have been formulated in a way I might have approved of or something like that, but it nonetheless would have come from some prior history of psychological research about how people have social presence in the world or something like that. And it seemed that actually it, it didn't come from that history. It came from a history that was always about let's have a very, very restricted mediator and study that. So uh, you were saying in the early days people were sat in rooms with only certain ways of communicating. So it's not about the difference between how we do things normally and how we do things um, when the mediation is unconventional in some way. It's always been about that unconventional mediation. So it's always had very, very isolated few mediators in all of its research. That's, I just wanted to check that. And I suppose the, the question then is, you know, why is there that kind of exceptionalism? Why is it that social presence is now an exceptional um, concept related to online learning or um, correspondence learning in the past? Is it, is it something that has ever been studied just in terms of how we might have social presence with the more usual mediators of language and social proximity or something like that? Um, yes, with the development of technologies or the develop, um or with the newer ways of communication, people always looked newer ways of defining social presence. I don't know why people insisted on the definition of social presence or the concept of social presence to explain all these new phenomena and build on the old one, which I believe created most of the problems. Um, but again, the term started from, yes, the mediation, and it was the capacity of the medium to mediate the interaction. Now. The understanding is that how people can actually mediate their relations with the people regardless of the medium. So um, the change was about that, that. That's the change that I wanted to um, underscore. But um, I don't really know why, for example, when internet came along, when people were able to write um, longer notes with much more personal um, details, when people did the discourse analysis on those notes, I don't know why they used, still insisted on the social capital to explain the personal aspects of it. It could have been many different things, but I, maybe it sounds catchy social presence. I don't know. Maybe they relied on the, maybe it was an easy way to rely on the history of it. There's already explained personal phenomenon. Let's expand it to a new technology. I don't know. I mean, if you think in that way, to me, like, talking to someone on Skype is like talking to someone right in here as opposed to, you know, back in time when I see, I guess people see someone over the uh, internet, it would be, you know, psychological distance. So perceptions are changing and technology is changing, but the concept is staying the same and or relatively slowly changing to the things. And I guess I kind of like diverted from your question. But, um. it, it, it just strikes me that the whole research agenda seems to rely on, you know, James Virtue's distinction between implicit and explicit mediation. It relies on really explicit mediation going on, and yet there doesn't seem to be much theorization of what mediation means or anything like that. You know? No, I think, um, I guess as an online education researcher, I'm going to say online education researchers are really bad, actually, to be honest, and they don't really... Um, I mean, we all are like higher education people, and if I can really mock to tell people, but uh, <laughs> um, definitely, um, I don't know. It's a very, um, I mean, it's, it's a very under theorized era, and uh, sorry, it's very under theorized um, research domain, and uh, a lot needs to be of, done. You know, like symbolic interaction and you know, gotten presentation of self in everyday life. You know, th th there's so many resources away from online environments that are about how people represent themselves in social situations. It, you know, and, and, and this isn't a criticism of you, it's a criticism, you know, yeah, 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 definitely. The concept and why those things don't touch, seeing as they seem to be trying to get at the same phenomena in different settings. That's, that's definitely true, and um, I think it has much to do with when online education was coming, um, something like, you know, MOOCs when it was becoming popular, online, online education was becoming popular, and it was the time that 
um, cognitive theory and psychology was much more prominent. Uh, and because I think, um, I mean, kill me if you don't mind me um, referring to you, but I think when this phenomenon was developing, it was mostly American universities and they were, you know, um, mostly focusing on the, the learning, teaching, as opposed to, you know, the social aspects of it. So it was all, all about mechanics and it's just focused on certain things over the others. I mean, we take things, we, we don't take things for granted. We question, we ask what's learning, what's that. And, but back then, I guess it wasn't just that it was like, I can't quantify your learning and therefore I'm going to um, tell you whether you learn it or not and I'm going to do an analysis and find reasons why you learn or haven't learned. That that was the research and that still is the kind of the research, so. So going back to your expert, <laughs> I would ask another question. So your research was telling us that social privacy, privacy has like higher correlation with the Mm -hmm. The positive learning experience, and then uh, bonding, like rather than bonding, uh, sorry, bridging social capital has like higher correlation with social presence. And so, is there anything uh, I can take out, like to take away from your presentation, that more specific, specific for teaching my own course? So, if that's the case, you are suggesting me to uh, try, okay, help my student kind of develop bridging social capital in the course, which is supposed to help them to learn and develop social credit better and then learn better? Is it that kind of lesson or implication can be? I think anything I say about learning would be putting me back into the criticism that I just did, so I don't really know <laughs> <anything> about <laughs> the learning. But um, the results show that when everything is happening naturally, so the courses are done in a way that very, you know, conventional manner. There's readings, you read the, you do the readings and you go back to the online and engage with people. You move on to the next week and so this is how the courses are done. And the results are showing that when learning is done in this way, it's very natural that bridge and capital is becoming much more valued for students. But maybe the take would be maybe we should do something to promote the bonding. I don't really know. Maybe it's that we should go with the natural way and promote bridging. It's actually something that I really haven't touched upon. And it's also very important that I should think about it for the next um, iterations of this research if I want to continue. But I, I think it's more like a pedagogical choice whether you want to leave it as natural or just do an intervention and help students with one way or the other because it, both types of interactions are much more um, needed apparently for the students. Interestingly, online learning promotes bonding with no reason. They think it's much better for students to learn, but again, learning is very um, much an open-ended question in here. Do you mind if I smoke? <laughs> <laughs> I thought it was fascinating. Uh, really Thank you. But I just, um, well, not a book. I was just, it's brought up so many ideas, it's difficult to put, put them into one sentence. I was, the one I'm going to go for is about the privilege. It seems mm -hmm. to me that when people come to an online course, rather than like the research which has been done with schools, which shows that some children have a confidence, which they are, they're already at, um, connected to the school because they get there by parents or by background or by, you know, the similarities of home and school where some children have a pretty big gap. And I'm thinking in terms of online programs, there must be something, it's speculative, but there must be something similar happening. And then when, or there may be, and then when you get into the actual online course, then you've got all these different patterns of interaction which may arise, mm -hmm. different contacts and different ways of developing maybe friendship groups according to, it could be cultural, it could be, you know, community. I mean, is that part of what you're interested in? Because you started by saying about social presence, but I get the feeling there's an awful lot more of thinking behind it and interest in how this is working. Um, you might answer that by talking about where you work during COVID. Uh, okay, so, um, Yes, social presence research actually touches upon the personal aspect 
only in terms of whether an, an environment is personal or not. So again, um, social cultural demographics are missing from the picture, unfortunately. So it's more like that whether you were comfortable enough to engage with people or not. And that was the question at stake when it comes to whether it's impersonal or not. Um, not in this research, but you know, my main research is actually on the um, social justice and equity aspects. And my dissertation was looking at actually this idea of privilege. And uh, I have this term, kind of like making terms, I guess. I have this term co called the, uh, the hierarchy of privilege. So there was this one supreme category that I defined, and then um, everyone else was positioned in relation to that category. But unfortunately, the literature not only social presence, but online learning literature is very much mute on that topic. There's much done to um, look at these kind of differences. Um, what was interesting to me was that when I was doing that work, my dissertation, I was working with um, doctoral level and master's level students, and they were, you know, people of power relatively in a way that, you know, they're not just 20 year old students anymore, they're working professionals and married people with children and everything. So, but still with, in, in that circumstances, people were still be able to talk about the hierarchy and privilege and power and this power. Um, so that was very much interesting to me. And I can't imagine what might happen if, if you look at what happens, you know, if you go back to like high schools or if, if there's any online, um, courses are happening in high schools. I mean, I don't know in here, but Canadian government is actually pushing a lot on the um, online programs for the high school students just to promote the um, uh, people at distance. And, um, but again, I think that is very much related to the social presence, the concept of social presence, but unfortunately, current definitions, as I said, is just about how you present yourself. And it's a very open-ended question. It could be many ways, you know. Um, <coughs> you mentioned the, um, the, the, the space on the number of courses. I was just interested in, in whether the courses are all focused on the same things, or they're focused on different disciplinary areas, and if they were, whether there were any differences. Um, all courses were on, offered by the, um, the Faculty of Education. It's called the Institute of Education back there. But, uh, it's a big, very big institution, size-wise and physical-wise. And um, I mean, relatively similar in a way that it's an education course, but the topics were very different. You could have find course on um, very specific topic like Foucauldian discourse analysis to educational policy 101 type of thing. So the course is actually coming from the whole institution, so I can't really tell on top of my head, but I can actually go and check. But uh, things are similar are the ways in which the courses are happening. So it's readings, discussion, readings, discussion, about 12 weeks. And then at the end of the 12 weeks, you write your final paper while you're doing the um, another course. And were the students asked to complete the questionnaire generally or in relation to specific? Uh, generally, at the end of the 12th week before um, they do the uh, official marking, not marking, before, um, student feedback. And um, we, it, it's, we, we were the team who were developing this online tool that we were using, so we had a chance to reach every other instructor who, who's, who were using this um, online platform, and we asked them a favor if they could just circulate this one. It's completely anonymized. We didn't collect any other information, so with a very easy ethics approval, we just get the data, did the research. Here I am talking. Well, thank you again. Oh, thank you all.